Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. And I'm working on building a university over here, a theological seminary. But I need some more calcite, which is this stuff, and I need to travel to a faraway land to get some more stuff. So in this episode, I'm going to be going on a journey in Minecraft to that place where I'm going to get some calcite while I talk about my personal theological journey. I know that's kind of cringy, but I don't care. So I'm going to start at the point when I converted to Christianity back in 2017 and explain how I came to believe what I believe today, how I became a Calvinist, how I became a Presbyterian, how I became, I don't know, a millennial, how I became really obsessed with kingdom theology, why I came to care about preserving the mainline churches rather than running away from them, why I still believe in evolution. I'm going to answer all of those questions. So my background... Just basically, I used to be a progressive secular leftist. Now, I wasn't like an expert on left-wing Marxist theory or anything. It's not like I had read any treatises on communism or socialism or anything like that. I was just a normal uh, high school or, I guess, middle school at the time, normal middle school boy who went to a public school in the suburbs of New York. And the reason I was leftist is because I was catechized to be so. Now, a lot of people want to pin the blame on the on the public school system. And yeah, my teachers were kind of liberal, but it was really just the cultural environment around me as a whole. Everyone was left-wing. It just, I couldn't even conceive of a world where people did not hold left-wing values. I couldn't conceive of a world where people did not support the LGBTQ movement, where people did not support feminism, where people... Um, I don't know, did not support, like, all the sort of left-wing social and economic policies. I thought leftism was just common sense, because I thought leftism was th the progressive way to think, and because, you know, science and technology are always progressing and getting better with the times, then humanity needs to do the same. Society needs to also progress and get better with the times. So I held a lot of really cringe left-wing beliefs, I was, I, I said I was in favor of socialism, like I said. I hadn't actually read any theory or anything. My reason for being a socialist was the same as basically every 14-year-old socialist. It's because I thought the Soviet anthem sounded really cool. I'm sorry. But, yeah, that was basically my background. And I converted to Christianity when I went to a summer camp in the Midwest. It was a music summer camp because I'm a musician. I play the viola. Still do. But it was a music camp with a Christian theme. And I went in there basically believing all the stereotypes about, you know, rural American Christians that I learned from, I don't know, the Daily, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah and stuff, that they were some of the most dumb people you could imagine. That's what I expected going in. But then I saw these Christians, these Christians my age, were some of the most kind, loving people I'd ever met. They had this sort of hope in their eyes that I never saw back home. And that moved me to become Christian. Now, I, I, my family had been in a church before. My dad became a Christian. He was uh, born Jewish, but he converted to Christianity after we had been going to a, a PCA church, a Presbyterian PCA church that our evangelical neighbors invited us to. So it's not like I had no experience with Christianity, but I had never really been in a community of Christians my age because back in New York, even though some adults are religious, basically every Gen Z person in the New York City area is completely atheist. It is a complete anomaly for a, a Gen Z person around New York to be religious. Like, where I grew up, a lot of people were either Catholic or Jewish, but all that meant is, do you open your presents on Christmas or Hanukkah? No one actually believed any of it. So it was really strange. It was like going to a whole other universe when I went to this place in the Midwest where there were people my age, like real people I could actually relate to, who actually believed in this whole Christianity stuff. So becoming Christian wasn't super hard because I already kind of knew what Christianity taught because my family had been in and out of this PCA church. So I, I had heard Christianity preached to me, but I just didn't agree with it because I thought Christianity, I thought all of religion was completely anti-scientific. Um, if you want to know the way I was before I converted to Christianity, if you've seen the show Young Sheldon, I was Young Sheldon, but instead of actually being smart, I just pretended to be smart. That's basically what Young Zoomer was, was like. That's what, that's what I used to be like. But once I converted to Christianity, it completely changed my perspective on life. I start to believe that every human person has, has value and stuff. 
and I did start to believe the essentials of Christianity, like Jesus rising from the dead and, and the Trinity. And once I got once I got back home uh, that summer, once the school year started, I started attending a church. And I chose to attend a Presbyterian church because in, in my hometown, there were three churches, Presbyterian, Episcopal, and Roman Catholic. And the reason I chose Presbyterian was not because I had done a, a deep dive into like the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, nor had I studied the other options very in depth, but I just had this sense that Presbyterians were the intellectual Christians, which is true. That I felt that stereotype because it, it's a true stereotype. Um, Presbyterianism historically has had the highest standards of education for its own ministers, for example. So given that I was coming from a very like scientific background and my biggest concern with religion was that it's like anti-scientific or anti-intellectual, that's sort of why I, I chose Presbyterianism to begin with. I didn't know anything about Calvinism or anything like that at the time. So yeah, when I started off, I was indeed Christian. I was indeed a believer, but I still tried to hold on to my left-wing values. I didn't yet believe that the Bible was the infallible word of God. I thought the Bible was probably a special book, but I was, you know, yeah, the, the Bible probably has errors. It was written a long, long time ago. I believe in God, but maybe not every word of the Bible. That's what I sort of used to say back then. A lot of people say you need to believe the Bible is the word of God in order to be saved. Not necessarily. If you're a baby Christian and you've believed the lies that the culture tells you about the Bible, um, you could you could be saved and still be mistaken about something like that. I, I don't think I was saved the moment I said the Bible is the infallible word of God. I think I was saved when I placed my faith in, in Jesus. But that's a different topic. Um, so basically, I was a Christian, but I tried to basically harmonize Christianity and leftism. I, I told people, like, I'm, I'm a liberal Christian, don't worry. Because once I converted to Christianity, all my Jewish and atheist friends got really suspicious of me. Like, I was notorious for being a leftist, even in my leftist high school. Um, everyone was like, hey, this Bernie Sanders supporter just suddenly converted to Christianity. What happened? A lot of people were surprised, and they were a, a little suspicious. But I was like, guys, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm still um, still liberal. I'm just, you know, I my version of Christianity says that you should just be nice to people. What's wrong with that? And they were like, okay, but we're watching you. And, and they were watching me. And something I noticed is that even though the um, the people that I had met at my Christian summer camp, even though it was completely different than them, they completely accepted me. But now that I was starting to be slightly different than my left-wing friends back home, they were starting to be really suspicious of me. And, of, of course, I'm not the only person to go through this. This is basically how every I left the left story goes. But I was like, yeah, the, the, the left doesn't seem as tolerant as they say they are because they're not tolerating other opinions. So um, halfway through my first year of high school, um, I started to really not only question but speak out against certain leftist teachings, not all of them, just the most radical ones, such as like the radical gender identity movement. I was like, yeah, I support LGBTQ, but I don't really believe there are 76 genders. And when word got out that I believe that, once I came out as not even conservative, really, at that point, once I just came out as not entirely agreeing with every single aspect of the trans movement, um, basically, some people exposed me, and it was over for my social life at school, essentially. Uh, my, my best friend at the time, like, betrayed me because some of her friends told her that I was a homophobe, which wasn't true at all. At, at the time, I was completely supportive of gay people and gay marriage and all that. Um, I think the word homophobe is just stupid, by the way. But at the time, I I wasn't anything like what the, the accusation of homophobia even is. At the time, I was completely supportive of gay people, even trans people to some extent. I just did not agree with every single aspect of the gender identity movement, but that's how cancel culture works. It's a fundamentalist religion where if you disagree with even one small part of it, then you're canceled, you're excommunicated. Now, Christianity also does have a strict code of what you have to believe, but Christianity admits that it's a religion. I'd be much more okay with leftism if they just admitted that it is a religion, but they, they try to pretend that it's like just religiously neutral, which of course it's not. That's why I learned that you can't be both Christian and leftist. So after uh, I got basically canceled by my entire friend group in high school, I realized, no, I cannot be Christian and leftist. So that pushed me further to the right. 
but I still didn't really know any theology. I was just sort of like one of those vague, generic, quote-unquote, conservative Christians who's theologically very misguided. So going into my second year of high school in, like, 2018, I started listening to, like, you know, Prager U and, and Ben Shapiro and stuff like that and talking about, you know, Judeo-Christian values because that was, like, my only source of, of conservatism. So I did go to church. I did go to a Presbyterian church, but it's a PC USA church. It's mainline. So of uh, as you probably might expect, my church didn't spend that much time and effort teaching me reformed presbyterian theology at least not the pastor especially because we had a really good pastor my first year of being in church but then he retired and he got replaced with an interim pastor who was a complete liberal heretic she did not believe the the resurrection was a literal event all that now she was only supposed to be a temporary pastor but based on her being in charge while i was in high school i was not learning any theology from her at least not any theology worth learning she did teach some stuff, but it was really bad and horrible, and I, I wouldn't recommend it. But it's like I knew well enough to, to filter what was good and what was bad. I just didn't really have a source of, of good teaching, so I turned to just mainstream conservative things like Ben Shapiro, PragerU, and I got my views even on religion from people like them. From I remember listening to like Dennis Prager's fireside chats, and he does say a lot of interesting things. I'll give him that. But if you want to learn about God... You, and you're a Christian, you should learn about that from other Christians, not not Jewish people, because it's it's a different religion. They don't worship the same God that we do. Um, and people say, oh, what do you mean? The, the Jews believe the Old Testament. No, they don't. The Old Testament's about Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus, all right? Um, Christian, the, the God of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of Christianity, not Judaism. But that, that's a topic for another video. At the time, I thought, like, because I was listening to these figures who were not Christian, I almost sort of like blended Christianity and Judaism in my in my head, and I even had like a Jewish girlfriend that year because I thought, you know, the religions are close enough. It's it's probably fine. And, and that ended up being a, a disaster. But this video is more about how I, um, what my theological journey was. But eventually, um, I started to have serious doubts about the faith. Like for the first year of being Christian, I was just so happy to be Christian. I was just really happy to finally have something to believe in. But then, after about a year, I was like, okay, how do I know that this is true? I'd come from a very, you know, I had a very scientific mindset in the past, and I was like, I want evidence that this stuff is true. And I was already concerned with the fact that a lot of scientific people seem to lean more atheist. I was troubled by the fact that a lot of the most wealthy and prosperous countries, like Sweden and Norway and Denmark, were atheist countries. And I was also troubled by the fact that I... Um, there didn't seem to be any really good arguments for God. Now, there are good arguments for God, but I didn't exactly have access to them because my spiritual advisors were, like I said, Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro. So I was left thinking that, just basically scrambling for myself to try and figure this stuff out. But I think God used that as part of his providence because... My first year being Christian, I didn't really bother to read my Bible and to actually learn about the faith. But once I started having doubts, that is when I became motivated to actually study this stuff, to actually study the things of the faith. And um, I started, like, actually learning about the Bible, slowly but surely. I started, I, I, I mean, I was already praying, but I started praying more earnestly for God to help me and help my unbelief. And... I didn't hide from my atheist doubts. I wanted to give my atheist doubts the best representation possible. So I followed a lot of, okay, finally, here's the calcite that I wanted to mine. I followed a lot of, you know, atheist voices on the internet. And I listened to a lot of atheist lectures and debates between atheists and Christians just to hear out their arguments. And it really did rock my faith to, to listen to that. But that, I think, is what God used. In the end, it made my faith stronger because I was able to listen to atheist arguments, reason through them, and develop counter-arguments to them. It was like a vaccine against atheism. A vaccine gives your body a small dose of the virus so your body can build up an immunity to it. I thought of some very good ways to express the, the proof that God exists. For, ex for example, like mathematics contains infinites, and we know mathematics is real. 
And if our universe is finite, how can the, our finite universe contain infinites? For one example, like pi, for example, has infinite digits. How can our finite universe contain infinite information? There must be some sort of infinite mind. And I'm sure, like, I think St. Augustine also thought of something, something like this. But after about six months, I thought I finally triumphed over my atheist doubts. But then I learned what Calvinism was because I learned that, you know, I'm part of a Presbyterian church and in my AP, uh, AP world class, I learned that Presbyterians were a Calvinist denomination. So I was like, okay, uh, let, let me find out what Calvinists believe so given that Presbyterians are Calvinist. And I learned that Calvinism believes some people are predestined to heaven and some people are predestined to hell. And I was like, what that? So... This was like a whole new bomb dropped on my uh, dropped on my faith. So I was like, my church teaches this. How can this be? Now again, I didn't. I hadn't known that my church teaches that because we're a mainline Protestant church. Now I was getting confirmed in my church at this time, and the day I was supposed to meet with my mentor, I was going to ask him about Calvinism. So I decided to read my Bible a bit beforehand just to get ready. I hadn't read much of the Bible ever before, so I turned randomly to a page with Calvinism on my mind, and guess where I turned? It was Romans 9, which says, God makes some people as vessels of mercy and some people as vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and if we think that's unfair, who are we to answer back to God? So that really freaked me out. So, my church didn't give the best theological instruction, but I did have a really good mentor. He was like the smartest guy you've ever met. It's like he was one of those people when he walked in a room, everyone knew he was the smartest guy in the room. He was like, a, he still is a professor at Columbia University. He like trains doctors there, really knows his stuff. And he was also a really deep theology student, really solid in his reformed theology. So, when I had my first meeting with my mentor for being confirmed, I expressed some of my doubts to him. I was like, you know, uh, if atheism is not true, then why are the atheist countries like Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and like, you know, all those, you know, West European countries, why are they so prosperous if atheism isn't good for society? And he answered the question like no one had ever answered it before. He was like, well, you see, those countries today are very secular, but their uh, economic and cultural systems are deeply rooted in historic Protestantism. And if you ask the average Norwegian what religion they are, they'll still say Lutheran, even if they don't subscribe to the doctrines anymore, because the, the effects of the centuries of Christianity are still benefiting their societies today. And I was like, okay, wow, that is a much more intellectual, well-thought-out answer. So he helped ease a lot of my doubts. So then I decided to ask him, okay, what about this Calvinism stuff? We don't really believe in this Calvinism, do we? And he was like, oh, yes, actually, we do believe in Calvinism. And I was like, uh-oh, this is, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to leave my church, but I might have to. So I considered Catholicism. I considered Lutheranism. Uh, Lutheranism especially because I knew that the best composer ever, Johann Sebastian Bach, was a Lutheran. That is the best argument for Lutheranism, by the way, the fact that Bach was Lutheran. Um... But I was like, I don't, I don't know if I can do this Calvinism thing because I had been catechized over the past six months by people like Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager. And because they're Jewish, they talked a lot about the importance of free will. They said that free will is like a reason why God must exist. I had used free will in debates against my atheist classmates as a reason for why God must exist. And now I was supposed to hold, give up this whole belief in free will. That didn't make any sense at all. Um, so I was like, okay, this, my mentor is really smart. Seems like he can help me. Seem like, seems like my church can help me, but I can't seem to get on board with this whole Calvinism stuff. And then, um, I found, uh, Tim Keller. I discovered Tim Keller because the, the, the PCA church that my family had gone to in the past, it was one of the daughter churches of Tim Keller's church. So my parents still knew about Tim Keller and they weren't like, Calvinists at the time. They were still trying to figure out what they believe, but they were like, hey, if you want to learn about Calvinism, I think Tim Keller believes in that. So I started listening to Tim Keller, and he explained the faith like I'd never heard it before. Um, Tim Keller passed away very recently, and I know that some people have like mixed feelings about him, but you got, no matter what your views on Tim Keller are, you got to say that nobody can explain Christianity logically like he can. And he is really good for New Yorkers like me, because 
New Yorkers, because of New York is such a secular environment, they demand that things be explained logically. They, they're not just going to take people's word for it. Like maybe in the South, they can say, you need to believe this because the Bible says so. And if you don't believe that, then you're going to hell. But that doesn't work for New Yorkers. New Yorkers aren't coming from a culture where everyone already has a general respect for the Bible. In New York, you need to actually convince people of it. And Tim Keller was able to do that. And it was because of Tim Keller that I finally understood salvation by faith alone. I remember seeing a, a short clip of him saying why Christianity is different. All other religions say there's something you have to do to get right with God. But Christianity says that everything uh, for your salvation has already been accomplished by Christ. And there's nothing we have to do at all. And we can depend entirely on God and not on ourselves. So, like, before Tim Keller, I, I'd heard this idea that some people think salvation's by faith alone, but I didn't understand it at all. But once I listened to Tim Keller, I finally did. And then Tim Keller finally made me be okay with, with Calvinism because he helped me see the beauty of it. Um, there's one sermon by him that was completely life-changing for me. It was like, does God control everything? And I expected, I clicked on it expecting him to say, well, no, God doesn't actually control everything. He said, yeah, God, God does control everything, but that doesn't mean the choices we make don't matter. The choices we make are, are part of God's plan. And he said, you should have a lot more anxiety if you think the choices we make actually can change the course of history. You'd be too anxious to even get up, get up in the morning if you think, like, due to the butterfly effect, your choice of breakfast cereal could result in, like, the death of some child 50 years later. That's if you believe that our libertarian free will choices can alter the course of history. That is the logical conclusion of that. It is good to trust that every event that happens is part of God's providence. So once I believed that, that completely changed my outlook on life, and I believed that God actually had a plan for my life. I wasn't just a wanderer trying to find his way. I, I realized that my story, just like the story of every believer, is a story about God trying to find me. And that um, impacted my personal life. That summer, I, I broke up with my Jewish girlfriend, not just due to religious reasons, many reasons, but th that was a motivating factor for sure. I had a growing understanding that, you know, you do not be unequally yoked to, to unbelievers. But she was my only social connection in school because... Because of my political views, because I did not agree with the cultural environment of my school, I had already been um, ostracized by my community. But especially that summer, after I discovered Tim Keller, the other important thing he convinced me of was that the Bible is the infallible word of God. For 18 months or so of being Christian, I, I had said that I'm a Christian, but I, I believe Jesus, not the Bible. The, the, I, the Bible is is important. It tells us about Jesus. We can sort of pick what's true and what's not from it by using our personal discernment. But Tim Keller basically destroyed all the objections I'd had to the Bible. He has very good lectures on that. And then I met, ended up admitting, yes, the Bible is the infallible word of God. I did not believe the Bible was the infallible word of God until I read it. And I realized that all these supposed contradictions were nonsense. A lot of people say, oh, I believe the Bible is the word of God until I read it, and then I became an atheist. It's like, okay, good for you. I don't know what you're talking about. I did not believe the Bible is the word of God until I read it, and I saw how all of it beautifully connects. Um, and to this day, I strongly do believe the Bible is the word of God. And I have a video explaining why I believe that. Now fifth grade atheist young Sheldon me could never imagine that my vocation, if you can call it, that would be being a Christian YouTuber. I never could imagine that. I would have been so ashamed of my future self, but I don't care because I'm very ashamed of my past self. And once I finally admitted the Bible is the infallible word of God, I had to finally change my views about homosexuality. And this was a really hard decision for me. A lot of people say, oh, you're you're bigoted against gay people if you think uh, same-sex relations are sin. You've just never met gay people. You you're just lived in some sheltered evangelical bubble. That might apply to some people, but I, I've never been an evangelical. I've, I was not raised in some evangelical bubble. I was raised in New York, and I, to this day, have many gay friends and family. And I knew it would sort of be betraying what they stood for if I were to come to the conclusion that same-sex relations, that homosexuality is sinful. But eventually, I simply had to admit that is what the Bible teaches. And I can either believe what my culture tells me or I can believe what the Bible tells me. 
and I had already seen why following the culture was a dead end, I chose to follow the Bible. And I finally admitted homosexuality was sinful, and if my social life wasn't already dead enough, that was it. So my junior year of high school, it sucked because I had absolutely zero friends, and I would still have to go to a public school every day where people would, like, make fun of the Christian faith and say blasphemous things, and a lot of people would just, there was so much degeneracy everywhere. But once again, God used this as part of his plan, because while I was not hanging out with friends, while I didn't have any friends, the only thing that I could do was study more. And because Jesus was all I had at the time, I began to, that like, that was all I began to care about. Like, all I cared about every day was, was reading the Bible, listening to sermons. I remember listening to sermons while playing Minecraft. And that's sort of one of the things that inspired the, the concept for, for this series. This series was actually the, the idea of my girlfriend who suggested this. But um, at the time, what I would do is I would play Minecraft while listening to sermons and other theology videos. So me playing Minecraft now while talking about theology is sort of me trying to recreate that experience for you guys almost. But... Yeah, at the time, school would suck, but I would go home, I would listen to theology lectures. I listened to, I listened to Tim Keller sermons all the time, but I also listened to people like, like John MacArthur. And now I see that John MacArthur's theology has really big problems. I have another video explaining that, but at the time, John MacArthur was still very helpful because even though t today I realize his theology has big problems, which I'm going to get into later, um, it was still helpful to see someone defending the authority of the Bible so passionately in a in, when I was surrounded by a culture that like blasphemed the Lord and disrespected his authority. So that was very important. So in my junior year of high school, I kept studying the faith. I kept studying like Calvinism and stuff. Uh, and I started reading the entire Bible cover to cover. It took me from like October to April or so because I don't know. I'm, I'm not the fastest reader. School ruined reading for me. I used to be like a really good reader. I was like top of my class for reading. But then in seventh grade, I just stopped reading because my crappy seventh grade teacher forced me to read the boringest books and then write like three pages on those books every night. So I started using spark notes and schmoop. And eventually when I got, got into higher grades, I wouldn't even use the spark notes. I would just echo back what the teacher said about the book and I would get like an A plus. <laughs> so yeah, um, high school, the English program was very subpar. And all you had to do to get an A in high school was just say some woke stuff about the book. But that's, that's off topic. The point is that in my junior year, I was motivated to finally study the faith and read the Bible. I read the entire Bible cover to cover in junior year. And that is when the, the COVID pandemic hit. Um, I hope we're now at a time where I can say the word COVID without YouTube getting mad at me for it. I'm, I'm not saying anything about COVID. I'm just saying that's when it happened. And everyone was in lockdown. So because I had basically no social life, I, th I thought, you know, I have nothing to lose. Why not use this as an opportunity to reach out online? So I did start a bit of an online ministry. I started this YouTube channel, but I didn't post anything on it yet. I And it wasn't called Redeem Zoomer. It was called Gospel for the Least. Like, um, about Jesus' parable where he says, like, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Um, and I started an Instagram page called Gospel for the Least, and it wasn't, it wasn't the same as Redeem Zoomer. Eventually I changed the name to Redeem Zoomer, but it was sort of like a proto version of Redeem Zoomer, and it was a much more woke version of Redeem Zoomer. Because at the time, I still believed the Bible was the word of God. I was still what you would call a conservative, but I still had some leftover woke views. I still, like was in support of, like, um, you know, CRT, that sort of BLM-style social justice, anti-racism stuff. I also posted a lot about that during the, the protests. And I was still an egalitarian. I still believed women could be pastors because, you know, my entire culture said that the most important value is equality. And I thought, you know, if the Bible is about being a good person, part of being a good person is about supporting equality. And I did try to formulate a biblical argument in support of egalitarianism. I wrote a whole essay called Why Dem Gals Can Preach. I mentioned that when I talked about my in my female pastor's video. So the proto version of Redeem Zoom, or the woke version, gospel for the least, as you can imagine, went absolutely nowhere. I got like maybe two followers who weren't like already 
people who were following my page. Um, it went absolutely nowhere. Nobody knew about it, and it was an epic fail, except for one thing. It did get me a girlfriend. So there were absolutely no Christian girls in my area of New York. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that in all of New York City, there, there's probably some, but um, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't find any, any Christian girls where I live. There's no Christian... And I'm like, okay, then you have to expand your scopes. And that's exactly what I did. Because everyone was communicating more online during the during the lockdown. Um, because I was reaching out online, I found another person who was also doing the same. Um, and now a lot of you guys know her on Instagram as the future Mrs. Zoomer. I met her on Instagram, like almost exactly, just over exactly three years ago, um, around, uh, right about now. I found her because her friend, who some of you guys also know as Redeem Zoomer Third Wheel on Instagram, found my account and saw that I was exactly like her in many ways. One of the ways in which I was like her is that we were both trying to use the lockdown as an opportunity to evangelize to our respective communities. And what she was doing was a bit more successful than what I was doing. She actually managed to create a Zoom Bible study made up of, like, people that she knew locally. And because she's from Kansas, uh, there were a lot more Christians in her area than there were in mine. So she invited me to join her Zoom Bible study, and within 13 days we started courting, and she's been my girlfriend ever since then. So that was a great blessing from the Lord, and it was especially great after a year of being absolutely alone in high school and having zero friends. So that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me, aside from, you know, salvation itself. And she destroyed the last remnants of my wokeness. She convinced me that female pastors are not biblical, and she basically turned me into a conservative evangelical, because she was part of the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, the conservative denomination, and now that I no longer supported female pastors, I was getting ready to leave the PCUSA. For a while, I just didn't care as much about theology. I wasn't listening to sermons as much. Um, and now at the time, I thought it was because I was no longer alone in my faith. But later on, in retrospect, I think the real reason had nothing to do with, with um, meeting my girlfriend. I think it was really because of lockdown, I had not gone to church and received Holy Communion in many months. Now, at that time, I didn't really have a developed sacramental theology. At the time, I was what you would call a Presbacterian, a Presbyterian who um, believes more of the like Reformed Baptist flavor of Calvinism, where Calvinism, in quotes, is mainly just about the five points of tulip, and they don't believe the sacraments actually do anything, they don't talk about the sacraments or think about them much, and um, because the, the Calvinists I was listening to, like John MacArthur, John Piper, were mostly Reformed Baptists. I had my Presbyterian phase. Presbyterian is a word I invented for Presbyterians who listen more to Reformed Baptists than to other Presbyterians, or a lot of people in the PCA I would describe as Presbyterians who have a more Baptist view of the sacraments. And I also was a was a complete, you know, Christian Zionist because I didn't know better, because I had listened to a lot of John MacArthur. He's a strong dispensationalist who thinks that um, like God has some sort of special supernatural plan for Israel, and um, I thought dispensationalism was just the Christian view, it was just the biblical view, because John MacArthur said it was. And I also didn't have that much value for the sacraments, because my version of Calvinism sort of saw a high emphasis on the sacraments as more of a, more of a Catholic thing. And that version of Calvinism is what I would call Presbyterian, because Baptist theology says, yeah, the sacraments don't actually save. They're just, you know, symbols. But historic Reformed theology, you won't hear this in a lot of modern PCA churches, but historic Reformed theology says that the sacraments are indeed means of salvation for the elect. But I didn't know that at the time. So yeah, I did have my Presbyterian phase. So what changed that? So when I first finally was able to take Holy Communion again, after basically a year of not taking it, I had like an internal revival because, you know, it's the real body and blood of Christ. Um, your spirituality, your faith will wither if you go too long without taking it. But once I did take it again, uh, my interest in like religion theology came flooding back. But I felt like this time I needed something else because in, in the past, my faith was just about surviving. 
because I was in a hostile environment of Christianity. But then I was going off to college, uh, and I specifically chose a college where I knew there were a lot of Christian groups. So when I sort of revived my interest in theology, it became less about surviving in the faith and more about how to actually put my faith into action because I was going to go off to college. My life was about to change. I needed something more than just reciting the five points of Calvinism over and over again until I die or until Jesus comes back, whatever comes first. And that's when I got really into kingdom theology, talking about the kingdom of God. And yes, my church did have a heretical interim pastor, but then her time was her time was up. And while she was um, while she was our interim pastor, I kept thinking, man, I wish I was part of the PCA because they they're actually preaching the gospel. The, the PCUSA is just fall into fall into liberalism and stuff. Um, something I forgot to me mention is that. Um, when I was still learning about uh, Calvinism and stuff, and I was getting confirmed in my church, I went on a confirmation trip, which was hosted by the denomination, not by my individual church. So while my individual church wasn't extremely progressive, the confirmation trip had pastors that didn't even believe Jesus was God. And one of the pastors on the same trip said that unborn children are parasites. That is the kind of stuff that happens in, in my denomination. So... Uh, anyone hearing that now, I'm sure a lot of you guys hearing this are like, bro, you gotta, why didn't you leave that as soon as you heard that? Well, for many years, I was like, I, I wanted to leave. I, I wanted to like go to a place where there was more sound biblical teaching. I sympathized with the, with the retreatism. But then once my interim pastor's time was up, uh, we got, we had to get a new permanent pastor. And I wrote a letter to the session of my church, the pastor nominating committee, saying, please let this new pastor be someone who holds to orthodox theology. Orthodox meaning just holds to the essentials of the faith, not like Eastern Orthodox. And it actually happened. Miraculously, they did choose a pastor who was a traditional Calvinist. He believed all the essentials of the faith. I read his statement of faith, and he began saying just things that I would hear from PCA pastors, like none of us deserve to be saved, but God gives us the free gift of salvation salvation anyway. And he began preaching the gospel, but there was something a bit different from the way he preached the gospel and the way people like Tim Keller and the other you know PCA guys, other Reformed Baptist guys preached the gospel. For him, he did talk about individual salvation, but it was more than that. His main focus was also on the kingdom of God. And he was, he quoted N.T. Wright a lot. And my mentor was also a huge fan of N.T. Wright. So I began listening to N.T. Wright. And that's, that was exactly what I needed at that time. I needed something that actually had a practical impact on my life in the world. And the kingdom of God is just that. And N.T. Wright talks about how Jesus' main message was not just how do you go to heaven, how do you avoid going to hell. It's about the kingdom of God in this world. Heaven is not some faraway place. The gospel is about the kingdom of heaven coming to this world and transforming it. So that's when my theology became very kingdom-centered. And that was the first time the pastor of my church actually helped develop my own theology. Because before that, it was just me trying to filter what was good and what was bad, what was okay and what was completely heretical from my uh, woke liberal pastor. But this time, I was actually learning stuff, and it was great. And I started to say you know, maybe there actually is some value to the mainline church that's worth preserving. Maybe it's not worth abandoning because there was just something about the mainline that was unique, that, that the evangelical churches, as good as they are, that they simply did not have. I couldn't quite put my finger on it before, but once I understood kingdom theology, I began to understand. If you put it into kingdom terms... The, the split off from the mainline churches was a surrender. It was a, it was a retreat. The mainline churches were the beautiful fortresses, the beautiful strong cities and fortified cities built for the kingdom that the enemy could never penetrate from the outside. But then the enemy sent secret agents in to hijack it from the inside, which is how they won. And then instead of um, fighting to retake the city, the soldiers loyal to the king just fled out into the countryside and tried to rebuild from scratch, but they were never able to build anything as good. They So the, the soldiers of the kingdom 
are now in exile. And that's what we see in these offshoot denominations like the, the PCA. They, are, they have a lot of believers committed to true doctrine, but they simply don't have the institutional kingdom ties that the mainline churches um, used to have and still do have. The mainline are just in the hands of people who don't believe the, the Christian faith. For the most part, but not entirely, there still are conservative and moderate remnants of the mainline like, like my pastor that I, like the new pastor that my church had just gotten. So that was a big development. Then I went to Texas, where my, where my university was, and there was good news and bad news. The good news is, finally, I was able to make other Christian friends pretty easily. The bad news was, a lot of the college ministries I found there had contempor very contemporary worship music. And at first, I tried to be okay with it. I tried to stomach the contemporary worship music and just get over it, just be happy that there's other Christians here for the first time in my life. It's great. Yeah, it was great. Don't get me wrong. It was wonderful having other Christian friends, and I would not ever go back to what I had before where I was just completely alone in my faith. But after a while, after a few months, something about the contemporary worship style down there really started to get to me, and something started to feel off about it. In Texas... Um, even though there's more Christians of all denominations down there because it's just more religious. Now, don't act like red states are some sort of safe haven. Red states are just 10, 10 years behind blue states in terms of cultural degeneracy. So it's not like Texas is, is going to be safe. New York is just uh, Texas 15 years in the, in, in the future. But yeah, at the time it was a lot more religious. But the vast majority of the Christians there went to like these non-denominational megachurches. And something about it just fell off to me. So that is when my theology shifted from just, like, the five points of Calvinism to actually understanding the Reformed tradition. Because the Reformed tradition, I was beginning to understand more and more, was not like this. I began to understand why the Reformed tradition believes historically in amillennialism, not dispensational premillennialism like people like John MacArthur taught. Because if you believe in uh, dispensational premillennialism and the rapture, then that's that does not um, that basically contradicts the kingdom theology idea that we're supposed to transform the world here and now. If the world's a sinking ship, then you just got to get off of it. So that's when I officially decided, okay, I'm I believe in amillennialism. And then when I went to Texas and I saw this all this low church worship, I was wondering, okay, why? does this type of worship feel so different than the type I'm used to? It's not, it feels like it's deeper than just the, the instruments that they use. Now, I, I, I really don't like the guitar and drum set in worship, but it's it, it does go deeper than that. And I finally figured it out. It's the sacraments. The reason that, you know, traditional Presbyterian, Lutheran, or Anglican worship feels so much different than a non-denominational church worship is because these traditional Protestant churches, just like Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, believe in the sacraments, that the sacraments actually do something. And that's when I realized, okay, Reformed Baptists aren't Reformed, because traditional Reformed theology places a very high value on the sacraments, but this, this Baptist theology really doesn't. So that's when I started to draw a line between Presbyterian is Reformed. Reformed Baptist is, is not Reformed. I Twice I actually went to Steve Lawson's church, which was in the area, but I eventually stopped going because I was like, you know, you know, Steve Lawson you know, might, might have a lot of good things to say, but he's a Baptist, and that means he's not Reformed. If I want Reformed, I need to go to a Presbyterian church. So then I'd be... I, my the, my theological interest was completely reignited, and I started studying like kingdom theology and sacramental theology, and all of that. And that's when I finally realized, okay, I I'm what you would call more high church. I'm always pushing for more high church things, more liturgy, more sacraments, more traditional worship style. So basically, being exposed to all the low church, non denominational evangelicalism in in Texas. Uh, that basically pushed me towards a more high church direction, and I stopped being a, a presbyterian, so to speak. And I finally understand that Reformed theology teaches baptism saves, and we really receive the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. So that, like, that was like the second big development in my theology. The first one was when I discovered Calvinism with like Tim Keller and all that. So I started de-baptistifying my whole theology. I was never Baptist, but a lot of the people I was listening to were. 
I pushed back on the notion that Catholics preach a false gospel. Baptists accuse them of that because they deny salvation by faith alone. But I started to realize that the center of Christianity is not the five solas, is not the salvation by faith alone, it's the ecumenical creeds. And I started focusing on that being the thing that unifies all denominations. And I began thinking a lot about different denominations. Partly because of my interaction with other Christians of different denominations online, and I began having long theological discussions with my girlfriend, the future Mrs. Zoomer, and our mutual friend who set us up, the Redeem Zoomer Third Wheel. That inspired a lot of discussions. So I was, in my uh, first year of college, I was thinking a ton about all of these issues. But I still continued to see a lot of Christians that I had known from either, like, from either school or the summer camp where I became Christian, I continued to see a lot of Christians fall to leftism. You know, I went from leftist to Christian, but I began seeing a lot of former Christians fall to leftism. And what really struck a nerve for me was when I saw the main friend who had been most instrumental in helping me come to faith, she fell to leftism. She used to be a Christian, but then she abandoned it, um, put the pronouns in her bio and started following all the like super woke, you know, LGBT accounts like Matt Bernstein on Instagram. And I was like, okay, Gen Z is completely falling apart and I need to do something about it. I can't just sit back and let this all happen. We, we must do something about it. And that is when I started Redeem Zoomer. I became well known for talking about different denominations, and I began promoting a revival of these classic Christian traditions, whether it's Presbyterian, Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist. But what I realized was that it was hard for people to find this classical Protestantism because the majority of Protestant churches are either in those traditions but liberal, or they're conservative but they're really disconnected from the historic Protestant traditions. I was talking all the time about Reformed theology. But it was so hard for people to find traditional Reformed churches because um, a lot of the modern Reformed churches, the modern Bible-believing Reformed churches, are disconnected from the historic Reformed institutions. And that's why, a lot, that's why a lot of people think Reformed churches aren't beautiful, which is completely untrue because historically, Reformed Presbyterian churches were just as beautiful as Catholic churches. But because most Reformed people that I knew were like PCA or something, generally those don't have beautiful churches. Generally, those are not connected to historic Reformed institutions. Um, so that's when I realized, you know, if... We, this Reformed theology and just Protestant theology in general is to thrive. It needs to be reconnected to its own institutions. The reason that people who are craving tradition always end up going to Catholicism and Orthodoxy is because, say what you want about those churches, they have not been estranged from their own institutions the way Protestantism has. And that is what gave me the idea for Reconquista. We need to retake the mainline church. So that's basically my theological journey. Recently I've worked through some more issues. I realized that I'm not a presuppositionalist because I think the church needs to be a light to the world and impress the world. I studied covenant theology and realized that I don't agree with republication. I've studied some more topics like union with Christ, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I hope some of you guys can learn from this, but this isn't one of my more educational videos. It's just me explaining my personal story, so thanks for watching and I'll see you later, guys. Bye.